Good morning, everyone. Uh, what I want to talk today about is really the lessons that I've learned and taken away from building in a number of different environments. And to start with that, I think one of the first things to kind of think about is how did we get here as a community? It's pretty phenomenal what we as a collective group have been able to do and are doing, but it's kind of a question of like, how did we get here? And so if we kind of take a quick stroll back through time, where did data science really come from? And I think most of a, the world kind of thinks about this history of data science really starting from this point uh, in Moneyball. <laughs> And this kind of like, hey, we could do something pretty special. If baseball could do it, sure, we should be able to do it in our companies. But one of the really powerful things about this is that data science actually started a long time ago. And there's a lot of places where we forget where data science really came from. And one of those places I first think about is like the Mayans and how they were taking these very powerful, well, doing these computations without the sophistication of the computational cloud infrastructure that we're so used to, to actually make these celestial predictions and figure out how to think about the crop and forecasting. Or let's think about the Indus Valley and what was being built out there and these phenomenal uh, uh, large-scale structures to do similar type of activities with incredible precision. And we often forget about the women at Bletchley Park of World War II, who actually are really the superpower behind saving the world in many ways, the world as we know it. They were using not only these computational infrastructure like, like uh, Colossus and Enigma and those type of efforts, but they were also the actual computers. That's where the term computers really were being used was these are the women. If you ever have a chance to actually in the UK to go out to Bletchley Park, and if you're fortunate enough to meet any of the women that are still there who give tours, they are the ones who actually did this work. And then, where did some of the real big initial push that we are sitting on top of, that we really we got to live, was 9-11. Because at 9-11, that time period of what happened was there was this question of how do we find the signal and the noise? And where is that happening? And so many of us who were in that, who were starting our careers in that time period, got to work on these 9-11 questions saying, how could we bring very disparate data sources together to actually find signal? And we found that there weren't tools, there weren't techniques. And so we had to go ahead and make them. And many of us, as we were doing that, actually transitioned to industry where we started to realize that a number of things were coming together. Not just the computational abilities, but storage, open source, and talent was really coming about together. Some of this was in the cloud, some of this was versioning in on-prem on clouds. All of this was happening simultaneously. And one of the places where we saw this really start to take off was when our efforts at LinkedIn, where we really had the opportunity not just to be a technology team, but to be one of the first product teams working on data, where we were responsible for profit, loss, engagement, all the different components. And we had the opportunity where people like Jonathan Goldman was, came up with this idea of people we may know and figure that out, and that just became ubiquitous across every social network around there, including Facebook and all the others at that time. Or we built out these products like Who Viewed My Profile? It turned out to be a, not only one of the big drivers of engagement on the site, but also turned out to be a strong revenue generation. This is a prototype that was actually of the original full-blown feature that was built by Chris Riccamini and Steve Stegman. We also had uh, Amazon showing these ideas of collaboration, collaborative filters, so saying, hey, people who bought this bought this type of thing. All these different versions were starting to take place, and we were actually going, hey, wait a second. These are actual new kind of data products that were providing large value. Job recommendation systems started to show up. This is Monica Rigatti's first prototype of this, which showed like, how, maybe we could actually give up and serve, give recommendations to people. And that we could show and start to visualize very complex aspects of data. This was a LinkedIn graph that we built. Some of you may have seen this as what was called in-maps at the time, being able to visualize your network and how everyone was related together. And this, we realized, was a new form of talent that was starting to take place. We were starting to realize like, there's a new thing here. And we didn't actually know what to exactly call ourselves. Hal Varian had started to talk about this a while before, saying the sexiest job in the next 10 years will be statisticians. And we were realizing, like, well, we should call something like that, but we had a problem. Well, if you call ourselves statisticians, the economists are gonna get kind of pissed off. 
And what about everybody else that's not a status? Like it, we, so we were getting to this, this identity crisis of what do we call ourselves? And this is a time period where Jeff Hammerbacher, who was running the Facebook data team, and myself would meet regularly to compare notes on what technologies were working, what wasn't working. And we started to ask, like, I actually asked Jeff this question, I'm like, what are you guys going to call yourselves? Because HR is coming to us and saying, hey, you got to have a name for yourselves. And I was saying, like, well, we have all, why can't we have all these titles? And they said, look, the engineers are engineering. Designers are designers. Sales is sales. What are you guys going to be? And so we had this problem of saying, what could we be? And Jeff had this, we started to build out this list of different titles, and Jeff had this idea of data scientists, and he said, it's kind of redundant. Why should we do that? And so I took it back to the team, and Monica Rigatti had this great idea. She's like, well, we're LinkedIn. Why don't we test every different job title? Like, why not just post it and see what happens? And so we posted it, and guess what everyone applied to? Data scientist. So guess what we decided to call ourselves? Data scientists. And when this happened, we realized that there was really something special going on. Drew Conway drew, put out this Venn diagram that some of you might remember as saying, hey, there's this data science thing here of hacking skills. We're going to put it in this Venn diagram format. Hillary Mason, one of my co-authors on a number of, uh, of the mini books, also put out this Venn diagram about what we were and how to think about us as awesome nerds. And Harvard Business Review said, hey, there's a big thing happening, so we should actually have a whole issue dedicated to big data. And we were asked to actually write an article, and we wrote this article. Tom Davenport and I wrote this article, and here's the thing. We wrote this article about arguing why you need a data scientist. And we had a title that was something like why every organization should care about data. And Harvard Business Review said, scratch that. We're taking a lesson from the Kardashians. We're going to figure out how to make this clickbait. And so they titled it Data Scientist, the Sexiest Job of the 21st Century. This has now become one of the, in the top 100 most downloaded articles ever in Harvard Business Review history. And it just was, it's been about 10 years since we, we released this. And it was kind of as stunning how much this took, took everything and all these executives saying, yeah, I need a data science team. I need, how do I do this? Who are these people? Where do we find them? Where can we recruit them from? Uh, you know, you saw these, article, uh, the, these job postings saying, hey, you need to have 10 years of data science experience. And we're like, how do you have 10 years when we just labeled it <laughs> last year? How does that work? Uh, so like this was taking off. And then what we saw is Monica actually produced this graph of we used the LinkedIn data to kind of get a sense of how many people were starting to label them around this. And we saw this unbelievable uptick taking place as people were really saying, wait, we could do something special with data. And then that led to this moment. Hi, everybody. Normally, I'd begin these remarks with a joke about data science but about half the stuff my staff came up with was below average. But as all of you know, understanding and innovating with data has the potential to change the way we do almost anything for the better. That's why my administration's opened up massive amounts of government data to the public for the first time, with more than 135,000 data sets available for download at data.gov. Think about the weather and map apps we check every day on our phones, many of which are powered by open government data, along with countless other apps and services, or our new Precision Medicine Initiative, which joins data science and healthcare to accelerate treatments for disease. We want more Americans to dream up and deploy innovations like these, to solve problems, save lives, and create new jobs and opportunities. That's why I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. DJ Patel as the federal government's first chief data scientist. And that's why I'm asking you to help. As DJ likes to say, data science is a team sport. That's why we want you, America's data scientists, to join us in this effort. Help us build better digital services for the American people. Help us unleash new innovation in areas like healthcare and climate change. Help us change this country and this world for the better. Thanks. So what happened in that moment why did President Obama say we need to have a, a person in the White House forever on going forward for what this should be? For, for like, 
that the president needs a chief data scientist. The president needs their own version of Spock in the situation room or any key meeting around data. I, I, yes, I did that. <laughs> the, the part, the reason of that is fundamentally spelled out in this mission statement, to responsibly unleash the power of data to benefit all Americans. And this was very carefully chosen. The word responsibly and all Americans. Just because we can doesn't mean we should, and we're having real questions about that right now on AI and a number of other technologies. And how do we ensure that it benefits everybody? That is the mission statement of the US chief data scientist. And it is a bipartisan aspect. It's there embedded in the, 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 for the White House, whichever presidency. And the Trump administration actually worked hard to try to hire somebody. They ran into some challenges. And then now there is a U.S. chief data scientist, Denise Ross, who is the current uh, uh, U.S. chief data scientist for President Biden. And the reason the president realized this is we are entering an era where all this comp the compute, the data, everything comes together in a way that the presidency must have someone that they can ask to give this advice at, at moment's hand of crisis or figuring out national policy or thinking about all the issues. And that really was the aha of President Obama to do that. And I had the privilege of taking that role. And so one of the questions to ask here, why has taken data scientists as a term taken off? Why has data science taken off? The first is, as I think we see with data science, is because we people are seeing that value proposition of what we can create the fact that we can actually produce tangible things that people interact with, even if they are digital objects. Even if it's a people you may know, a jobs recommendation is adding value to somebody's life. The second reason I think the data scientist title has taken off fundamentally is because honestly, no one knows what it means. But think about it. You know, one of the things that I think we've done really well in industry is we figured out how to put people in boxes. You're an engineer, you're over here. If you're an engineer, should you be allowed to do design? You'd probably say no, get in and stay in your lane. If you're allowed to do sales, no, you're supposed to stay in your lane. If you're a data scientist compared to a business analyst, imagine you go to a certain meeting and you're in that meeting and you were in business analy or in analytics or business analytics and they're like, why are you here? And you said you were in one of those two roles. They'd be like, hey, this is an important meeting. You shouldn't really be here. If you're the data scientist and you're in that meeting, they're like, oh, thank God, somebody brought somebody smart to this meeting. And then what happens? You have context. And when you have context, now you can have impact. You can take your skills, you can take this, this all this us, rest of the stuff that's going on and apply it. I kid you not, the number of times I was in a meeting at the White House where people were like, why is DJ here? Like, they're like, okay, we get that he's a chief data scientist. And then, but what's, what's he supposed to do on criminal justice reform or policing? What, why is he here? And then by the end, they'd be like, oh, you have all these ideas. Like, how are we going to address body cameras? For example, when body cameras first came up, in this questions that happened around the killings of uh, Michael Brown and many other people of color, the questions of body cameras came up. And we asked a simple question around that table, which is, what's going to be the privacy policy around that data? What are we going to do when there's kids in that footage? What about somebody who might be a potential victim who might receive further threats, typically a spouse who's a victim of domestic violence? What are we going to do in those situations? Who's going to pay for the cost of bandwidth, not just the cost of the devices. And then by the end of the meeting, it was like, oh, that's why we don't invite DJ. <laughs> Those are the kind of questions that would come up, and that's why you need this. But the fundamental thing about this is it's the power because we are a horizontal. We aren't just a vertical. And by being that horizontal, it allows us unbelievable latitude to be effective. And so I want to talk a little bit about the problems ahead and the problems that I see, the way I think about what is happening from the privilege that I have had with the people I've been able to work with for the things I think we should do. And at first, I want to tell you the story of Jennifer Bittner. 
And Jennifer, uh, she's a really remarkable woman. And I want you to imagine this situation. One day, you're walking into the office, and you get handed a note. This is a note I carry with me regularly. And it's by the chief of staff of the president. And he hands you a note, and he says, the president would like your answer about what we're going to do. So you get the note, and you're like, not sure what to do with that. You kind of look at it, and you read it. And it starts like this. This is the actual note. Dear Mr. President, on April 2nd, 2014, at age 36, I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer with metastases in my liver, lungs, adrenal gland, spleen, ovaries, spine, hips, clavicle, ribs, and many other bones. Every oncologist told me and my husband to get my affairs in order. One oncologist said I would be in hospice within three months. I'm the kind of person your precision medicine initiative will be helping and saving, and I want to do whatever I can to help. I come from a middle-class family in Pittsburgh where my father, a proud Vietnam veteran, was a telephone lineman for 40 years, and my mother was a homemaker. I am proud to have worked my way up, to a public vice president role at a publicly traded health care company in Austin, right here in Austin. Ironically, I married a cancer biologist named Rod, who is, who's, while completing his doctoral work at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Despite both working in healthcare, we find ourselves at a loss for a long-term solution to my cancer. The average life expectancy for stage four breast cancer is three years. Three years. I have so much more to give this world than three years would allow. Think about what you would do if you got handed this note. You know, as a country, we are the country that unlocked the secrets of the atom. We are the only country that has sent a probe to every celestial body in our solar system. We are the country that discovered the human genome, unlocked the DNA. We are the country that receives the most Nobel Prizes consistently. What would you do? If it was a national security crisis, there's a bombing or a terrorist attack or anything else, we know what we'd do. You go to the Situation Room. You call everyone together. You create a national plan. So that's what we did that night. We went down to the Situation Room, called everyone, called Francis Collins, who's head of the uh, National Institutes of Health, decoded the Human Genome Project, a number of others, and we said, what are we going to do for Jennifer Bittner? Because it's not just Jennifer Bittner that we're focused on. Every one of us knows a Jennifer Bittner. And unfortunately, in this room, many of us, not some of us, many of us are going to be a Jennifer Bittner or have one of our direct loved ones who is a Jennifer Bittner. Some of you are going through this right now. What are we going to do with it? And that became not only the foundation of the Precision Medicine Initiative, but also the Cancer Moonshot. And why would you put the chief data scientist in charge of that effort rather than the head of the National Institutes of Health, the guy who decoded the Human Genome Project? It's because the president recognized we need a fundamentally different approach to tackle these problems. It has to be a horizontal. Just like the data science components that we all embody, we are horizontal. We have to be able to pull all these things together. And the solutions for this is not just in the medical records that are locked up in thousands and thousands of silos across this country in some hospital or doctor's database, but it's also locked up inside our ability to think creatively about how we use data. How do we do it in a safe, secure way? How do we do it in a way that is really fighting for the Jennifer Bittners? 
Those are the problems that are really ahead of us. That kind of capability. And we, are started, we have started only to scratch the surface on this. Because remember, just as we start to figure out these solutions, we have to make sure that they work for everybody, too. Not just one population. they got to be affordable. Because you know what's going to suck? Is we find that magical solution for Jennifer, and she can't pay for it. She can't afford it, and she can't receive it. That's equally a death sentence. So let me give you a switch gears and give you another version of data science that we're seeing on the front lines. And this one starts on March 14th, 2020. Some of you may remember that day very clearly in your mind. I certainly do, because it's Pi Day. <laughs> but it also, something else was happening on March 14th. COVID. At this point in time around the world, we had 65 deaths, uh, 9,815 cases. Just beginning. Here in the United States, we had two cruise ships just beginning to dock in the US with COVID uh, positive patients. And we really didn't have a clue what was going on. Italy was showing unbelievable issues starting to show up. We had very little information out of Wuhan. And we were really worried about what was about to take place. And so I received a call. Got this call that said, hey, what was going to happen? And a bunch of this is featured in this book by Michael Lewis about premonition, uh, called The Premonition. And we got a call that, that afternoon saying, hey, we're worried about this. What should we do? What should be our strategy? And they laid out a strategy for data. And I said, that's not what I would do. And they said, what would you do? And I said, give me a couple hours. And we literally wrote this memo. This is the actual memo that we wrote in two hours. And there's a couple key components of it. The first being, hey, you know what? We need to have this pragmatic, we need an extremely pragmatic, nimble, results-oriented strategy that supports the acquisition of timely data, cleaning of data, putting data sets together, a system to look for insights, uh, supporting traditional epidemiologists uh, in mathematical models, and the evaluation of models as new data is acquired. Does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> You've probably had a version of that like a dozen times in your life. For those of you that are in companies, it's probably in like every one of your pitch decks. It's the same thing, whether it's government or industry. It's the same thing over and over again. But there's another component that we realized. We said, we need a team. And we're going to put together a team. We have identified the following data scientists and engineers who are ready to start working immediately on this mission. They are literally the, the very best in the world for this kind of work. They are ready to start immediately, virtually, because we're pulling them in from around the country. And it should be able to travel to Sacramento for work trips. And if we wanted to, we were willing to relocate them for a period of time. The next question I got on this was, how much is it going to cost? And we said, cost? It's a pandemic. <laughs> What do you mean cost? We're going to work on this right now. And so we put this team together. This is an initial team. This is Todd Park, former US CTO of the United States. Bob Kocher, who uh, uh, wrote the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Jenna, who designed the software for uh, uh, the Dragon sp uh, Space, uh, SpaceX capsule. Uh, Mike Wilkening, Secretary of Health. Uh, Charity Dean, who is uh, uh, the protagonist and public health official and uh, premonition and figured, knew that COVID was happening. And she was the first, first person on the boat uh, when, the, when the, uh, the cruise ships landed to figure out what was going on with the patients. And so we put this team together and we said, hey, we got to get this stuff going. We got to start figuring this out. And so the first thing we did is we said, just like we translated that, we said, we need to have these five components figured out. So if we're going to start with modeling. We got to have a model. Everyone's like, what models? Right? We, got, we, got a, we need an epidemiological model. We need to do this. And so we realized we didn't exactly have a model. And what we needed to do was build one. And so we found this model out of, uh, at that point in time, Justin Lesseter is a research scientist at John Hopkins. And he had this pretty sophisticated model by standards of epidemiolog epidemiology at that time. And we said, great, can we run it with all the simulations? And we discovered a slight problem. It was basically running on a grad student's computer under their desk. And we're like, we're going to decide the policies of the state of California 
the fifth largest economy in the world on a grad student's computer? That doesn't seem like the best thing. So we had another strategy. We said, hey, let's get two of our best engineers that we could think of and ask them to help come and help. Actually, three of them. Kit Rodolfa, who actually designed the campaign strategy for President Obama, also a healthcare expert, and helped build Devoted Health. Sam Shaw, who helped figure out how to scale data uh, in products and engineering uh, at LinkedIn. And Josh Wills, who was, uh, many of you might know from a lot of his talks around, also work at Cloudera and at uh, Slack. And we asked him, I said, hey guys, could we come together and build this? And then I made a place to call to Werner Vogel, and I said, Werner, I need some compute. And he said, how much? All of it? <laughs> how much can you give me? And they were gracious enough to give us as much compute as possible, as well as their internal teams to build out that model. And that model turned into this, the very first ability to have any insight on what was happening with COVID. It also showed that if we had anything close to what was taking place in New York and Italy, we were going to be out of beds instantly. And we had only one option, which is to basically buy ourselves time, buy ourselves a little bit of time to get our healthcare system to catch up. We had no PPE. We did not have enough reagent to actually do testing. We had to spin up the testing facilities. We needed all of that in place. And that led us to dashboards. And we needed to create those dashboards real time to give the data to the, to, to the governor to figure out decisions and the hospitalists and everybody else. And we turn around and we say, guys, where's your dashboard technology? And guess what we got? What dashboards? What technology do we have? Where are the data pipes? None of that stuff existed. The data products, all these different things, we realized we didn't have the infrastructure in place. And many of you also helped start spinning this up, and we realized we needed it all yesterday. And the key thing I have to point out here is what does it take to actually respond in a crisis? How fast can we go from zero to 60? And what I think we found is that we were wanting. Our stuff is too hard to actually get to work with each other. Our stuff is too hard to deploy. We love to pat ourselves on the back about how awesome we are and how cool our technology is, and it is cool. But did it actually help us solve things at the end of the day? That's where we found, and that is the opportunity ahead of us on this data products. We had to figure this out. And let me give you an example that we did end up building. This is called CalCat, which is actually a thing we built specifically for all those public health officials at the county level who were constantly under attack from their city council and under threats, death threats, literal death threats. And we put the models together and we said, hey, here's what we think is going to happen. Here's all the models that we could get as new people were building out new models from different states, different academic centers. We put it all together. And this is what gave them the ability. Because what they were able to do was then print this out and share it directly with the, with the council to ask, here's how we can make good decisions. Here's because we had a strong tension. We have to figure out what we're doing with our schools. We know the consequences of shutting down schools. We know the economic trade-offs of what happens when people don't get to go to work. Essential workers, all these components. And we had another component of this that we also realized, and this is something I think we really need to take away as data scientists. We really needed to focus also on what is really happening on the ground, not just that data aspect. As Kara, um, Karis DeFries had this idea. She said, hey, you know what? We're getting a lot of traffic to these, these California websites that are talking about our COVID strategy. What happens if we just put a survey on there and ask people to give us what they're thinking? And it was amazing the response that would get back to us. And so we started to put this deck together, this data, this data briefing insights book with all the insights that we could find that were happening around the state or the country around COVID and layering onto it actual quotes. This became a must read for any policymaker in California before they went to bed. Was not only looking at the data, but really being able to ask the get a sense of what was in people's head, the fear, the anxiety, the concern. Doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you were on, but understanding this. 
This was a data product that got spun up in real time and added some of the greatest value in there. And then finally, as we think about data catalog and data sets, as we started to spin this up, one of the things we realized is this. Like, well, we have data, but we don't have a way of putting it together. We don't have a way of doing it. And so we had to put a get together a data catalog really fast. I didn't have things like data.world. I didn't have things like that, that data hub uh, or Acro. I didn't have any of this stuff. And so what did we do? We found that people were putting all this data in databases, and no one was utilizing it. So we said, well, we're going to create a data catalog. This is literally our data catalog. This wonderful technology that you're seeing, you might have heard of it. It's called Excel. <laughs> this became the thing. And then it was basically like, if you have a question, email DJ. He will tell you what's happening in the table. If you see something that's different, call DJ so that he can update the very sophisticated data catalog. <laughs> that's literally it was our state of the art. Why? Not only procurement, but the speed at which it takes to spin up these technologies, get it all to work. And then the insights. And as I mentioned, that book with the quotations and the what was really going on, this is an example of that, that data book, what some of the types of analysis that was happening. And that was really one of the power that we saw was this unique new united front of data science that came together. We had all these organizations like the COVID Tracking Project, COVID Act Now, US Digital Response, academic programs, Crisis Ready. Most of these were all volunteer efforts. There was no dollars around this, mostly because people were stuck at home with shutdown orders and nothing else to do. <laughs> but the power that came together because we as a community decided to do this, that's what really took off. That's what made the change. That is what was the real power behind COVID that people don't talk about. And we need to, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact as we're talking about this, in this country that I talked about that has put an object to every celestial body in our solar system lost one million lives due to COVID. One million Americans are dead because of the way we responded to COVID. We have a national crisis around mental health. You probably heard the amazing people at Crisis Text Line yesterday. If you didn't, search them out to talk to them about the work that they are doing. We've seen an unbelievable impact to teenagers on this issue. We've seen a backsliding of, uh, of gains we've made on education. We've had destroyed economies, small businesses. So how did we do on this? Not great, despite having a playbook post Ebola. But how much worse would it have been if we weren't there as a team? That's the power that we have as data scientists. We are coming together. And this is really kind of leads to the, 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 the end of what I think are the biggest lessons I've learned here. The first is the data points have names. You got to learn their names. You got to tell their stories. You have to remember the Jennifer Bittners. You have to remember all the people on the front line that have done work and what happens. The greatest lesson of this, it was instilled into me by President Obama, was that this lesson. And one day I was learning about, talking about the updates around precision medicine. He gave me an explicit order to say, you have to get out there to the community and know their stories. And I went and I went to all these foundations and groups that represent these populations and got, to, got their input and came back to him. And I said, here's what they're saying. He said, did you actually talk to the real people? I said, no, sir. And let me tell you, the last thing you ever want in a life is an ass kicking in the Oval Office. It is not a good place to live, <laughs> to be at. And I went back and I went and I talked to the people who were on the ground and got to hear their stories and what they were concerned about around their data, what the way they wanted their data to be used. And it changed my life. It changed my perspective on what was going on. And he was absolutely right. President Obama was spot on. That you have to get out there and know their names. So often, we love to, and when we're building products, we have some persona. We have some amazing persona. Those personas look like, they're like, like, who are these happy people? No one's this happy at work. No one's this happy at home. Like, it's like photo frames, like when you go to a store and you're like, who are these people? 
get out there, learn their names, learn their stories. Let them inspire you, see, let them challenge you about the things. That is one of the biggest things that I've found. Two, the small things, it's the small things out there. Those small, tiny pain points. That's what makes the whole thing break down like in COVID response. It's the tiny things that were the biggest and most challenging. And fundamentally, it's just like that data catalog. It's the unsexy work that creates the biggest impact. Those low-hanging fruit, those are the blockers. But you, someone's got to do it. Someone's got to roll the sleeve. Why does it take the US chief data scientist to actually write the data catalog? Because no one else would do it. So someone's got to just roll up the sleeves and do it. Some of you may have seen that we produced these stickers. Well, we wrote a book. Hillary Mason, Mike Lucchese, and I wrote a book about data ethics. And this was one of the components that really got stood out. And a guy named Dr. Popular actually made these, made these stickers. If anybody, if you find me afterwards and want one, just ask me about them. I'll, I'll give you one. Is move purposely and fix things. Our strategy should really be around, there are so many things around our society, so many things around our work environments or other processes. What happens if we adopt this as a mantra to really move purposely and fix things? Start really getting after things, those small problems, start changing it that way. Ask ourselves, we need to, how do we ensure this technology works for us, not against us? What are the unintended consequences? I had the opportunity to help write and draft the national uh, AI strategy, which was quickly adopted by China also, because they were like, this is so good, we should do it. And now it's built on. And many of the things that we've talked about are the questions and issues we have at hand right now. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we do this? And I would assert also that we should think of a technology as neither radical nor revolutionary, unless it barely benefits everyone. And we're really great at creating technology, but it doesn't benefit everyone. What does it take for that technology to get pushed out to every Jennifer Bittner out there? What would that look like? And then think bigger. We are all thinking big, but I push you to think bigger because the problems that you all are capable of, the problems that you all are capable of is so stunning. And what can we unlock if we push bigger? Some of you may have seen my blog post about this announcing when I came to Great Point Ventures, the problems I'm focused on, these problems that we call MIPS, massively multi-interdisciplinary problems. How do we go after drug discovery? How do we go after some of the hardest problems in national security? How do we go after infrastructure that is going to be able to spin up and take care of a problem like we've seen around COVID, just like that? How are we going to address problems around education or climate or so many other different areas? What would that look like if we dedicate just a little bit of our time for that? Maybe some of you are going to dedicate your companies, the things all the different ideas like Pete talked about. Like, what would that look like if we dedicated time and energy to help work on those? The hardest problems today need you because your kids and your kids' kids are going to need it. And then finally, I'm going to end on this, which is data science is a team sport. One of my asks for you is we're a community. We're a team. That means we should act like a team. We should look out for each other. We should help each other and start really asking what can we do to support each other. None of us got here on our own. I did not, definitely did not get here on my own. I have come from an incredibly privileged opportunity of so many people supporting me along the way. And I've had amazing teams I've ever been able to work with. And so my ask of you is there is somebody here in this community, maybe they're in this room, maybe they're out there somewhere else, who needs help. What would this look like if you gave them a little bit of time. Many of you have already done office hours here. What if you did a little bit of office hours with them? Maybe there's somebody in your organization who's struggling a little bit, who's raising their hand. And what if you just gave them a little bit of time and energy to help? That's what a good teammate would do. That's what a good citizen would do. That's what a good friend would do. That's what a good partner would do. That's how we should act as a community. Those things is really what's going to carry us forward. And then fundamentally, I want to just say thank you to all of you that have been working on these problems, working in this community, helping make us all successful, and really have adopted this mindset of data science as a team sport. We couldn't do it without you guys. So thank you.